20 years ago, we all found in different ways, in different places, but all at the same moment, that our lives would be changed forever. The world was loud with carnage and sirens, and then quiet with missing voices that would never be heard again. These lives remain precious to our country and infinitely precious to many of you. Today, we remember your loss, we share your sorrow, and we honor the men and women you have loved so long and so well. For those too young to recall that clear September day, it is hard to describe the mix of feelings we experienced. There was horror at the scale, uh, there was horror at the scale of destruction and awe at the bravery and kindness that rose to meet it. There was shock at the audacity, audacity of evil and gratitude for the heroism and decency that opposed it. In the sacrifice of the first responders, in the mutual aid of strangers, in the solidarity of grief and grace, the actions of an enemy revealed the spirit of a people and we were proud of our wounded nation. In these memories, the passengers and crew of Flight 93 must always have an honored place. Here, the intended targets became the instruments of rescue, and many who are now alive owe a vast, unconscious debt to the defiance displayed in the skies above this field. It would be a mistake to idealize the experience of those terrible events. All that many people could initially see was the brute randomness of death. All that many could feel was unearned suffering. All that many could hear was God's terrible silence. There are many who still struggle with a lonely pain that cuts deep within. In those fateful hours, we learned other lessons as well. We saw that Americans were vulnerable, but not fragile. That they possess a core of strength that survives the worst that life can bring. We learned that bravery is more common than we imagined, emerging with sudden splendor in the face of death. We vividly felt how every hour with our loved ones was a temporary and holy gift. And we found that even the longest days end. Many of us have tried to make spiritual sense of these events. There is no simple explanation for the mix of providence and human will that sets the direction of our lives. But comfort can come from a different sort of knowledge. After we wandering long and lost in the dark, Many have found they were actually walking step by step toward grace. As a nation, our adjustments have been profound. Many Americans struggled to understand why an enemy would hate us with such zeal. The security measures incorporated into our lives are both sources of comfort and reminders of our vulnerability. And we have seen growing evidence that the dangers to our country can come not only across borders, but from violence that gathers within. There is little cultural overlap between violent extremists abroad and violent extremists at home. But in their disdainful pluralism, in their disregard for human life, in their determination to defile national symbols, they are children of the same foul spirit and it is our continuing duty to confront them. After 9-11, millions of brave Americans stepped forward and volunteered to serve in the armed forces. The military measures taken over the last 20 years to pursue dangers at their source have led to debate. But one thing is certain. We owe an assurance to all who have fought our nation's most recent battles. Let me speak directly to veterans and people in uniform. 
The cause you pursued at the call of duty is the noblest America has to offer. You have shielded your fellow citizens from danger. You have defended the beliefs of your country and advanced the rights of the downtrodden. You have been the face of hope and mercy in dark places. You have been a force for good in the world. Nothing that has followed, nothing can tarnish your honor or diminish your accomplishments. To you and to the honored dead, our country is forever grateful. In the weeks and months following the 9-11 attacks, I was proud to lead an amazing, resilient, united people. When it comes to the unity of America, those days seem distant from our own. Malign force seems at work in our common life that turns every disagreement into an argument and every argument into a clash of cultures. So much of our politics has become a naked appeal to anger, fear, and resentment. That leaves us worried about our nation and our future together. I come without explanations or solutions. I can only tell you what I've seen. On America's day of trial and grief, I saw millions of people instinctively grab for a neighbor's hand and rally to the cause of one another. That is the America I know. At a time when religious bigotry might have flowed freely, I saw Americans reject prejudice and embrace people of Muslim faith. That is the nation I know. At a time when nativism could have stirred hatred and violence against people perceived as outsiders, I saw Americans reaffirm their welcome to immigrants and refugees. That is the nation I know. At a time when some viewed the rising generation as individualistic and decadent, I saw young people embrace an ethic of service and rise to selfless action. That is the nation I know. This is not mere nostalgia. It is the truest version of ourselves. It is what we have been and what we can be again. 20 years ago, terrorists chose a random group of Americans on a routine flight to be collateral damage in a spectacular act of terror. The 33 passengers and seven crew of Flight 93 could have been any group of citizens selected by fate. In a sense, they stood in for us all. The terrorists soon discovered that a random group of Americans is an exceptional group of people facing an impossible circumstance. They comforted their loved ones by phone, braced each other for action, and defeated the designs of evil. These Americans were brave, strong, and united in ways that shocked the terrorists, but should not surprise any of us. This is the nation we know. And whenever we need hope and inspiration, we can look to the skies and remember. God bless. It was vintage George W. Bush. Those of us who covered him were sitting here saying, uh, I bet he's going to go there on t kind of trying to teach a lesson to America about what it should be, what it could be and should be, uh, talking about the fact that right now uh, every disagreement is a naked appeal to anger and resentment, uh, and going on and on about what specifically he's standing in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where Flight 93 went down, the fact that this group of Americans uh, could have been it's a rand it was a random group, but it was an exceptional group of people, and it could have been any American. Remember, I was just looking up the date. It was six days after 9-11. Then President Bush went to a mosque, intentionally so, 
in order to make the point in his words and his actions that what happened and the people who perpetrated those attacks might have been Muslim, but they were using Islam in vain, and that wasn't what the Muslim faith is all about. And we kind of all took for granted that that's what a president should do. And we no longer do that because of what we have seen over the past five years, and frankly, uh, even more recently uh, with people in both parties, but specifically uh, some of people in his own party refusing to stand up and do what's right when it comes to the basic facts and truth of things that happen in this country. You, I remember well covering the White House in those days, and even most Democrats would tell you in the immediate days after 9-11, the president of the United States, who happened to be a Republican, he was the president of the United States, uh, was pitch perfect. Now, 20 years later, uh, many Democrats won't listen to George W. Bush because of the Iraq War and the political polarization of that. Uh, Trump Republicans won't listen to George W. Bush because Donald Trump spent so much time uh, essentially wipe, trying to wipe out and criticize and undermine the Bush establishment of the Republican Party. I hope all Americans, in some ways this is not a day for politics. In other ways, you just had a former president deliver that speech, so there it is before you. I come here without explanation or solutions, mm -hmm. not trying to lecture. Uh, but talking about those days when Americans, we didn't care after 9-11. Nobody cared if you were a Democrat or Republican. Americans did hold hands. The people in that community, I've been there many times. Shanksville is such a special place. I don't know if they're Democrats or Republicans. I know what they did and the comfort they gave to the families whose family members were vaporized on a hillside and didn't have a place to stay and didn't have a place to eat. Uh, that, was a, that was a horrific time in America, but the former president's right. It was also a really special time in America. It is naive to think that any president can give a speech or any of us can analyze that speech and bam, we're gonna get back to it. But this is the reason you do celebrate, mark, commemorate, big anniversary, so that everybody stops and thinks. And so maybe everybody could stop and think. The president says this is not mere nostalgia. He's right, he ri he's right. On big issues, on big questions, we have a pandemic now in front of us. On big issues and big questions, Americans should be able to say, I'm putting that on the drawer. Let's have a conversation as friends and neighbors. Again, it's naive to think that that's going to wipe away, but I hope, I hope everybody, regardless of your plus, just listens to that and remembers, for those old enough, remembers those days. But he was. Again, the Iraq War damaged it. But he was pitch perfect immediately after talking about how America is remarkable because, as Dana noted, those random people who did such an exceptional, heroic thing. I also think when you look back at 9-11 and you're thinking of what it was like that day and the threat, and now you look at what the threat is now. That is what so many people think about. That's what the DHS secretary was talking about when he was being interviewed on CNN earlier. And, and what President Bush was saying there about domestic terrorism, which, of course, we know we've seen so many warnings about that. 